So now on to our next plenary session, Appetites for Change, Where Food Meets Finance. Here we'll explore the disruptive innovations occurring in our food system. With these disruptions, we're seeing both investment risks and opportunities, requiring a radical rethink in how investors and companies allocate capital and maximize returns. Our next speakers are in the forefront of these innovations. We're thrilled to have Jeremy Collar, Chief Investment Officer and Executive Chairman of Collar Capital, a firm that has invested roughly 16,000, invested in roughly 16,000 private companies worldwide and has about $17 billion of assets under management. Jeremy is also a leader in charitable services in the field of human health and animal welfare. He recently launched a farm animal investment risk and return initiative, a collaborative network that shares research, fresh thinking, and best practices to help investors understand and manage farm animal risks and opportunities. We are also so very pleased to have Jeremy here to talk about his personal journey and passion for these issues and being joined by Ethan Brown. Ethan is CEO of Beyond Meat, a company he founded in 2009 that creates solutions to actually replace animal protein with plant-based protein in order to better protect human health, the climate, natural resources, and animal welfare in a unique and powerful way. So please join me in welcoming Jeremy Collar and Ethan Brown, as well as our moderator, Mark Bittman, to the stage. Okay, um, gentlemen, Mark, Jeremy, are, are you a vegan? Uh, unfaithfully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, we don't have to ask. Um, can you tell me? I, I'm a vegetarian that's trying to be vegan. Can you tell me a little of your non-dietary backstory, how you got where you are today? <laughs> Um, a friend of mine asked if he could write my obituary four years ago, and uh, I, I had no idea what he was talking about, but he asked, can he write it? And I said, yes, I want to live to 100, and uh, my four ingredients for happiness, 100 happy, my four ingredients would be purpose, love, health, and gratitude. And um, so, so he wrote this obituary, and... Um, it was just a friend asked and to do it, and he said, you die tomorrow. This was four years ago. And he said that um, you know, you've built an industry and made a lot of money, and you are a total bore. <laughs> and um, which was a good friend. A good friend, exactly. <laughs> and he said, but I'm just telling you what he said. He said, you are the most amazing 98-year-old. And uh, he said, you have a business school named after you. And we agreed that um, uh, you know, on a personal journey, authentic for me would be to end animal factory farming. And so um, and because I became a vegetarian at 12, because I didn't believe in the way some animals were brought up, didn't know which ones. And so I went the whole way till I thought, when I was older, I could make a decision which ones. And so we put that down. And it, it was very interesting, from that moment, four years ago, to switch from being a bystander, as it were, to being an upstander, and having this mission in life to end animal factory farming. But then you ask yourself, what can an individual do? It just sounded so stupid. You know, okay, you're a vegetarian, but what can anyone do to make any difference? And, and you know, qu quite sh soon after that, had an epiphany that ESG is one of the most powerful movements in the world, together with consumers, 
together with businesses, um, investors can really change the world. And so, um, you know, I thought ESG, okay, do that. And, but then looked into it a bit more and, and just echoing a few things that you were mentioning. You know, I don't know if people really know why we've got into this position that Mark's talking about. It's all to do with the green revolution. You know, this, we had a wonderful green revolution about 70 years ago, started in the US, where, where there was a confluence of factors that the cereal yield went up so dramatically because we discovered or invented herbicides, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides, and were also able to uh, genetically modify wheat strains or, or create new wheat strains. And those together meant the crop yields went up so dramatically that farmers um, started going bust and losing money because there was an abundance of cereals. So what do you do? And what farmers did was, well, with the discovery of antibiotics around the same time, they said that, um, uh, why don't we feed these cereals to other animals and we can put them into feedlots and into cages and, you know, the rest is history to where we are today. So just to give you one example, in 1992, 30% of pigs were kept on a factory farm in the US. By 2016, it was over 97%. You know, over 50% of fish consumed today is farmed. And so this epiphany that actually um, ESG can change the world. So looking at, well, are there investment risks? And then you look a little bit into it and you have companies like Hallmark Westland, which is a Calif was a California company, the largest meat recall in history. And, and that was a meat recall just purely on the basis of an investigative reporter going in, paid for by Hallmark Westland, saw the animal welfare was so bad within this meat company, they had to do a meat recall, which cost $116 million, but that didn't bust the company. What bust the company was um, a class action that if animal welfare is so bad, how can they have health and safety? And so, you know, we started um, uh, a, an initiative called FAIR, F-A-I-R-R, Play on Internal Rate of Return, the Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return, to simply bridge the knowledge gap that we have. And we came up with four inconvenient truths to, to in a, just to outdo Al Gore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you could easily compartmentalize the consequences of this green revolution. And the consequences are um, in human health, in climate and pollution, in food security, and in the planet's resource. And it's very simple to compartmentalize each. I mean, I'm not sure if the audience really knows that 80%, 80% of all antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms. That's an astonishing number. It's the number one user of uh, antibiotics, factory farmed animals in, in the world. And in terms of climate, as Mark mentioned, um, it's, it's a bigger contributor to greenhouse gases than the whole of the transport sector. In terms of food security, you've got the green revolution. In terms of the planet's resources, it's the number one user of fresh water and the number one reason of deforestation. 91% of the Amazonian deforestation is a result of factory farming. And um, it takes 1,000 liters of water to get 100 calories from a cow. As opposed, to, as opposed to 38 liters water from uh, 100 calories from potatoes, for instance. But what's interesting is that these four horsemen of the apocalypse are, um, have, have um, really um, uh, contributed to risk factors, f um, returns for companies. So Yum Foods, which owns um, uh, uh, KFC, Burger Pizza King, Hut. Pizza Hut, you know, has underperformed the MSCI for the last five years because of various flu epidemics, etc. Hellman's mayonnaise is starting to have issues. Com for example, com there was an avian flu epidemic 
last year, and there was uh, volatility in the price of eggs. And um, Compass Group serves 8 million meals a day in the US and has switched all its, all its mayonnaise to, to Hampton Creek, which is a plant-based mayonnaise, no eggs. And so, um, and even two weeks ago, the largest meat manufacturers in the world, JBS and BRF in Brazil, have, have, have been really hurt because they've been selling rotten meat, et cetera, and their IPO is canceled, which they were looking at to do in, in the summer in the US. And um, that's a backstory. <laughs> uh, Ethan's is somewhat different. <laughs> it is a little different. Um, so first of all, it's a real pleasure to be up here with both you guys, and, and um, so the audience knows we have a, a great uh, set of personal relationships as well. Uh, Mark really put my uh, business on, on the map uh, many years ago now. Drove, uh, took a train down to, to Baltimore, and then uh, picked him up and drove up to uh, the western part of the state of Maryland, where I had a small uh, factory um, in a, an abandoned hospital um, where we were producing plant-based meat. And Mark found that interesting and, and thankfully put a, uh, a story together that was on the front page of the, of the um, Sunday Review in the New York Times. There's a beautiful picture of a chicken with broccoli coming out of the, uh, the head, which I, which I loved and have kept. Um, and then uh, Jeremy um, is an investor. And after hearing that he invested in 16,000 companies, I don't feel so special anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> because when he's investing, it's like the diligence. You think you're the only one. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, so, um, but we've all, uh, you know, in this together and, and working hard on a, on a, on a very uh, similar set of issues. Um, how I came to this field um, was indirectly and, and really through the process of kind of shedding um, uh, expectations about what I was supposed to be doing and, and my own internal biases about where my career should be going. Um, as, as a kid, um, I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in suburban Maryland. Uh, but my dad is a professor, and professors have some time on their hands, um, although they won't admit it. And, uh, and so uh, he come from a, a rural uh, part of New England and wanted us to have an agricultural experience as well. Uh, so we bought a hobby farm that was supposed to be a place to sort of recreate and relax, but being entrepreneurial himself, um, ended up having about 100 head of Holstein cattle there. Uh, and so very early, I learned a lot about animal agriculture. And it was a fine you know, family operation, and we had partners and everything, and, and it, 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 nothing untoward happened. But I, I had trouble in my mind making the distinction between the animals that we kept uh, in our house and in, in my bedroom, right? My dog slept on my bed, and the animals we kept in the barn. Um, and you know, that, that started to get me to think about uh, the food process and, and, uh, and how we create meat and, and what goes into uh, producing protein through animals. I set that aside, uh, went to, to college, um, went into uh, you know, subsequent education, and um, went into the ener energy sector and worked for a long time on alternative energy. And I worked on, and it's important because it, I think it colors the way I think about this problem, I worked on uh, fuel cells, um, which are great technology, and they actually are, are going to begin, you're starting to see them emerge a little bit and, and compete with electric drive. Um, but uh, I was in that because of climate change. Uh, and I, I really wanted to make a uh, strong contribution to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's interesting um, to have a colleague from the, the, the World Bank here. Um, I had an opportunity when I was quite young to hear a guy named Robert Goodland speak. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell. Uh, he was the chief environmental officer at the World Bank for many years. And um, he was not in any way a left-leaning guy. He's a, just a, a scientist who wanted to understand the environmental impact of various things and did an exhaustive study after he left the bank on what was really driving greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, he and a guy named um, Jeff and Ang did this study. So they looked at the t entire life cycle analysis of, of creating a, a piece of meat uh, through an animal and came up with 51%. And that's been disputed. The UN said, no, it's much lower. The number is more like 17 to 18. Uh, but if you actually look at this study, take the time to read it. It was published in 2009. There's some really fascinating parts within it. And one that I find particularly compelling is that there's an unnatural number of animals on the Earth's surface because of industrial agriculture. Each one of those animals is breathing. So it doesn't matter whether that's being grass-fed on Michael Pollan's farm or being raised by JBS, it's still breathing. And when it breathes, it respires carbon. Just that carbon, right, is uh, contributing about 14% of greenhouse gas emissions. Forget about the methane that everyone jokes about. So, you know, we can do a lot of things as humans, but creating an animal that doesn't breathe is probably not one of them. 
So it's sort of a catch-22. So how do we solve this problem if those kind of facts are true? Now, I won't get into the debate, and there are better scientists than I that will, will debate that, but the number's really big. And so I was in this energy sector thinking about climate. I said, well, why am I focused on this? And I had an opportunity to be at a, um, a guest at, uh, this is in sort of mid-2000s, at um, the Defenders of Wildlife uh, for dinner. And um, I, you know, they're going over all the achievements that they had uh, uh, affected, but yet they were you know, serving um, meat at the center of the plate. You know, and I said, this cannot be right. Like, we've got to think about these problems differently. So continued within my career um, in, in the energy sector, um, but increasingly just got nudged into thinking about how can I make a stronger contribution? And it's really the four things that, that Jeremy spoke about that compelled me to do this. You know, if I could solve for, uh, for uh, human health with heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, and those epidemics that are linked to animal protein consumption, mm -hmm. if I could sol help solve for um, climate, help solve for natural resource use uh, and, and the depletion of natural resources due to meat consumption. And then lastly, animal welfare, by doing one thing, and that's to basically change out the protein at the center of the plate, I found that to be enormously compelling. Um, and when you think about meat, I think I think about meat maybe differently than some people. I don't think about the origin so much, I think about its composition. And if you think about the composition of meat, it's really five things. It's amino acids, it's lipids, it's carbohydrates, almost none. It's trace minerals, and it's predominantly water. We also understand the architecture of meat. You can go to a textbook at any land-grant university, and it'll show you how the tendons lay in there, how the fat's distributed, how the water's distributed, how the protein's distributed. So we can get all these materials outside the animal in the plant kingdom, they're abundant. We understand how to build, we have a blueprint, we have the architecture of meat. Why are we running it through an animal? And that was the fundamental question that I asked, when I started my company, and it turns out you really don't need to. That's the fascinating thing. We are so willing to, to disrupt and change so much about what we do, whether it's the cell phone I have in my pocket versus the landline, the automotive industry versus the horse-drawn carriage, but we assume that an animal is needed to create meat, and that assumption is false, and that's really what we're doing. Now, we're not gonna get there by browbeating people into giving up meat. I think there are three things you can count on the human race to do, to fight wars, procreate, and eat meat, right? <laughs> For most people, two of those things are desirable. Two out of three are desirable. Um, <laughs> so I think we wanna keep eating meat. Uh, the question is, do we need to eat meat that comes from an animal? And the answer is no. Like, so, so my goal and my company's obligation is not to tell you to participate in meat Meatless Mondays or give up meat one day and then have it for six days out of the rest of the week. We don't do that with our land phones, our, our iPhones and go back to the landline for six days out of the week. <laughs> you, know? you don't hear people talking about, you know, my daddy used a landline and you know, my granddaddy used one. I'm not gonna give up my landline. No, we're drawn. <laughs> we're drawn to the iPhone because it's better. So my obligation is to make a product that's better that draws you to it and so I focus much more on the science of this than the marketing. I focus much more on let's make a product that's just a no-brainer. Like if you can have a beautiful hamburger in all of its succulents and it's made from plants, you'd probably do that. But it's not here yet, right? And so we have to get people, we have to continue to work on the science to get it there. And Mark tried some very early versions of our products um, and we've gotten better and better. We're not there yet, we're probably 80% of the way. I think the truth is, and what's so fascinating about this is it can be done. So my guess is that 50 years from now, uh, meat will still be a huge and central part of our diet. We will not be eating salad, but we'll be eating meat uh, uh, from plants. And that, that's what motivated me and got me involved. You said an interesting thing to me uh, the other day, and I'm just wondering if you would repeat it about sort of what your ultimate goal is meat creation-wise. In terms of the, 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 the uh, supply chain and everything? In terms of eatability. The bacon. Weren't we talking about steaks? Steaks, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we started with what's the simplest thing to do, which we think is, you know, which was first poultry because of the way the muscles lay. Um, and then uh, we've gone into um, to basically a, a burger form, which is a ground form because of the, um, uh, uh, again, it's, it's ground. You, you, don't have, you can sort of hide in that a little bit. But, but, um, but ultimately, uh, we are going to be creating both bacon and steak. And that's a, that's a, a piece of art. I mean, there's so much intricacy in that, I mean, how fat's distributed, how, how the, the tendons are, are, are distributed. Um, and we will get there, um, but it's going to be, uh, it'll, it'll be several more years. But today you can buy something called the Beyond Burger um, in the meat case at Whole Foods. So we refuse to sell it to grocers unless they put it in the meat case and Whole Foods raised their hand and said, we'll do that. Hopefully Mark will stop them with their 
<laughs> but um, but we will uh, we're going to expand into conventional grocery next month, um, and uh, and it's sort of step by step, but species by species, we can get this done. You know, we're here, I think, primarily to talk about investments. I, I wonder. I, I'm going to take it for granted that you'll agree with me that we have to both discourage industrial production of agriculture and encourage alternative forms of producing food or what might be called alternative forms of producing food. Uh, I'm going to disagree with okay, that. Okay, well, but, but partly that because, might be even more interesting. No, but <laughs> partly because, you know, to feed the world, we have to have industrial um, agriculture. It's not just about little farms. I think what Ethan's saying is he's industrializing um, uh, protein into, into what people want to taste and eat. And, and so I, I, it is a journey, but people want, people want to have burgers, but they'd prefer it if they didn't die of obesity and, 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 and cancer. Let me rephrase the original statement. Industrial production of animals. I'd agree with that. Okay. <laughs> so the, so I, I'm wondering two uh, things. Sorry, can I just point other animals? We, we, so, <laughs> no, it, it's very important. We, we, we are so alienated from ourselves. I mean, this isn't an this isn't investment point, but we're so alienated. We forget that they are other animals. We, you know, we've, we, you know, California's been at the forefront getting rid of racism, gender issues. No, but we are speciesist very much. You put pictures up there, and you know of what f future generations will tell us. You should have been ashamed of yourselves. Right. Um, I I would like to know how each of you think that most practical steps would be to close one single CAFO or some number of CAFOs, one factory farm just what the most practical way to do that is. And at the same time, I mean, I'd ask you that question, of this, and I'd ask you, Ethan, um, what people can do to most support companies like yours um, in starting and growing and becoming sustainable. Because I think those are the two, those are the, sort of the two ends of the same rope that we need to pull on. Yeah. Well, I, I keep in mind the strap line, eat less and better meat. So it's nothing to do with vegetarianism. Um, the, on the investment side, it, it's got nothing to do. It's, it's about materiality, not morality. You know, um, you've got examples. I mean, to take it away f so that people really, really see it, you've got examples like SeaWorld, where a film, ca there's a confluence of factors. Con there's a pull from consumers. There's, there's businesses are becoming aware. So you've got... Uh, Virgin America s serving cage-free eggs, which is, is part of the journey. And you've got policymakers. I think we've got Jerry Brown speaking afterwards. He's in a, I've never met him, I, I don't know much about him, but he's an amazing, he's a, a truly amazing man. One of the things he's done is, is, stop the, um, is, is to stop the prophylactic use of antibiotics in, in, in California. That becomes an investment risk for, for, for owners of, of ag, and so as a regulator. Another example would be, um, which is away from farm, factory farming, is, is SeaWorld. A simple film that cost $110,000 of, of trainers of, of SeaWorld orcas um, created, created the, the way an investor would see it, and this is the way we've got to translate it stuff. The way an investor sees it is that um, uh, attendance went down, CO terminated, 1.5 billion of investor value destruction mm. with a $110,000 film. So, you know, becoming aware of that, we've created a book under FAIR, 28 uh, ESG risks. And, um, um, you know, what we've done is to, is to, we've got two engagements we've, we've started in the last couple of years. One is uh, we got two and a half trillion of AUM to write to 10 restaurant chains 
asking them what are they doing about antibiotics in the food supply chain. It is an investment risk. And another engagement about protein diversification. As Ethan says, it's, it's looking at people, it, companies like General Mills and Unilever realize that you cannot feed the world with, with meat protein. It takes six kilos of plant protein to get one kilo of animal protein. We're starting to realize that it takes four kilos of wild fish to get a kilo of farmed salmon. The, these, the maths does not work. And um, regulators will create investment risk. So I think um, what we can do as individuals is eat less and better meat. If we're foundations, and by the way, if we're in institutional investors or even series, uh, I was speaking to Mindy before, but you know, even within your own organizations, you talked about the 90, 10, you know, you, well, we could have, what we do with our own um, organization is, I, I, I went to our ESG committee and said that um, I, I wanted to take factory farming as an issue for, for, for our investment company, thinking they'd laugh at me, and I was really scared. And they, they were unanimously agreeing with it, but they said, it's going to cost you. I said, why? He said, because um, we've got to be a role model. We should not serve factory farmed food. We, we give free lunch uh, at, uh, uh, as long as people stay in. Um, <laughs> that's not so free. At their desks. At their desks, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, it's not so free. Um, but uh, um, um, but all, uh, um, and then any event that we do, you know, we should tell the event organizer that they should they should make sure that one no factory farm food at the event, and that we, we've got uh, a 75 25 percent rule: 75 percent plant based, 25 percent meat or fish. And if if we look at you know, I mean, uh, this is not you know if. Um, uh, at, at most events we're at, you know, there's so much meat and fish that's just wasted. And, and so the, these are just simple practice. I also, you know, if you're a foundation, I, there's a lot of foundations here, but conditional giving. So, um, um, we, we, uh, my foundation gave 100,000 to the Royal Academy of Arts in the UK. And, and but, but suddenly said to the, to the fundraiser, actually, there's a condition. No, no factory farmed food in your restaurant. She said, we can't do that. And so wrote to the trustees, and the trustees were unanimous. Why would we serve this shit? I mean, that's literally what they were telling. And, and so it's just becoming aware. So for me, it's a great question around, you know, what, what do you think the most practical way of, 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 of closing, let's say, one uh, KFO? Um, and I think very relevant to this conference, um, you know, if you, many of you probably took microeconomics and if you, or operations courses, you know, the central theme of, of many of those textbooks is around eliminating the bottleneck, increasing the efficiency. And when you do that, you should be able to lower prices and increase uh, sales, et cetera. And, um, you know, that's what we're doing. We're removing, we're, we're removing the bottleneck of the animal, right? And so, for, from, in theory, we should be much lower priced than, than, uh, than uh, from a production perspective, uh, than animal protein, which would allow for better margins. And so, in fact, if you look at the margins that JBS and Purdue and Tyson and others are, 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 uh, are generating today, they're not admirable. I mean, they're, you know, they, they in fact, um, you know, sometimes they're negative, depending on, on the, the levels of supply and the market and the demand for it. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing is taking protein directly from the field. We're using a process which is essentially heating, cooling, and pressure. And so if you, you know, are aware of how diamonds are made, for example, diamonds are made through, through uh, heating and pressure. It's a, many of the things, materials in the universe are, are made that way. And so we're essentially stitching together the protein in a way that's muscle-like um, to provide that same, same form. And we're doing that with protein that's been taken directly from the field. So we're removing an enormously expensive bioreactor, which, which is being used today, the animal, to, to create meat. And so um, how that relates to your question, um, it, from a profit-seeking behavior, uh, our margins are gonna be much higher at scale, or uh, they should be, based on that principle, um, than the animal protein market uh, today. 
And so that's why you see companies interested in what we're doing. Um, you know, Tyson recently invested and in, uh, took a 5% stake in our company. Um, so I think there's actually a, uh, I don't want to sound too idealistic, but I think that there is a... Tyson said they, they're now announcing that they're a protein company. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, so, so, and, they, and they are sincere about that. I mean, I've met with their leadership many times, and they are sincere about they want to be considered a protein company, uh, not a, a necessarily an animal protein company. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you can align profit-seeking behavior with it's also good for the world, basically the principles of this, of this group, um, you know, you, you can start to do things like close those facilities that people don't like. Very few people, uh, you know, like being in what you talked about, the, the farmers don't like being in that squeeze between high input costs and very low commodity prices. Meat producers don't like being in that same squeeze. And a lot of people don't like eating what they're eating. So if you can provide an alternative for that that also makes money, you'll see change. Is there a... Um a technology that you're lacking? Is there something you, you wish you had to make progress yeah, faster? Uh, like a al alchemy, but, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Short, short of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, yeah, no, we you, had this discussion before. Yeah. To, to me, it seems like you have gone about things very pragmatically, very practically. You've never sold yourself as a tech company. You've always right. said the kinds of things you're saying now. You're, you're not you can talk about things on a molecular level, but you talk about food, right. and you're a food company, so, and you know I admire that, Thank so you. I'll say, even say it publicly, but Thank you. is there a, is there a something that would make life easy, short of alchemy? Is there something you're yeah, waiting for? Yeah, no, it's, for? Great, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it's really about time. I mean, it's, it's so, we have very high levels of confidence that, that, um, that we can create a piece of meat directly from plants, and and um, you know a lot of the technology, a lot of people we've hired actually have come out of the medical field, so we use a lot of the particularly pharmaceutical um, understandings of proteins and things like that. Um, so that does help, but it's time. I mean, it's just every year we get better and better. Um, and you'll still, so Mark was with us uh, a, week, a couple weeks ago and, and tried one of our new products, and you know characteristically he said we have some work to do. Um, and uh, but you know literally in the next he'll he'll try it in the next couple of weeks and it's gotten better. Um, and so it's, it's just time. We have about, uh, we have about 22 or 23 scientists that are working on this. They're from you know, the best schools and the best institutions, and they um, you know, were previously working on things like cancer, et cetera. And, and you know, they can do this, we can build this, but it's gonna take time. The research center where, where they work is called the Manhattan Beach Project, one, because we're close to the beach there. But two, I wanted them to understand that this was a, a global problem that required a, a global solution that we weren't gonna get there by spending as if it were culinary activity, we had to also bring in science to this. And so we are a food company, and we always adhere to the principles of the food business in terms of not making it too complicated so people are scared or it's franken food. Um, but, but if you apply, if you spend like you spend in alternative energy, if you're willing to put that kind of money in, and if you're willing to put up with some losses, uh, you can get there because you can get the scientific uh, understanding, you can combine that with a culinary understanding to get an outcome that is truly a piece of meat that's been built from plants. Um, I think I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll, we have some questions from the, at least I hope we have some questions from you folks. So, and to anticipate, no doubt, one of those questions, Jeremy, is there a, is there a place investors should be looking right now? Is there, a, are there some general or specific recommendations you like to make? There, there, the investment opportunities like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger, Memphis Meats, etc. That they're, they're still in the growth stage. They're not really for institutional investors yet. They're, they're venture capital in, in invested companies. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll grow very rapidly. Um, I, th I think it's 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 looking at you know, it's like health and safety in the oil industry. Um, you want to know that the health and safety record is 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 the best in in for an oil for for an oil company because that way you will avoid a mechanic. So, so it's avoiding risk. And I think um, look, you know what Unilever are are doing, taking it very seriously. You know what's happened is it's moved to the mainstream, and so. Look, um, we're getting more and more research, um, like Morgan Stanley have done a lot of research and, and other investment banks on, on 
on the record of companies and what changes they're doing, you know, like Compass Group switching to the mayonnaise. So I'd st stick with the mainstream as an institutional investor, recognizing that things like Yum Foods or B this Brazilian largest meat manufacturer in the world it, it creates investment risk if they don't have health and safety. That's the kind of research to look at. But can I mention one thing about ending CAF, uh, one factory farm? Uh, I asked Mindy if I could say this, but there's a, there's a side meeting at 3.30 about antibiotics, FAIR, FAIR has got in the California room on, on antibiotics if, if anyone is interested. Because if we can, we have, for our, all our sakes, um, you know, I know friends that are now dying from pneumonia, et cetera, who, who would have been easily, um, you know, antibiotics would have solved those issues a few years ago. We, we, this is a, a, a very dangerous uh, road we've gone down. So at 3.30 AMR. At 25,000 deaths a year from superbugs. Yeah. And climbing. Yeah, and, and by the way, being vegetarian or vegan has got nothing to do with it because a bug, a super bug, becomes resistant to antibiotics and jumps from human to human. It's a, it's a new bug that goes around all of us. Um, Brooke has audience questions? Yes, I do, Mark. <laughs> all right, so I'm one not. question that came up is around, um, for Ethan, the... Um, the supply chain that you're building out for your business, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the principles you guys are applying in sourcing your ingredients. And also, um, in, in the event that you really scale and penetrate, which I'm sure you will, the markets, um, of supermarkets across the country, um, what will be the challenges in, in ensuring the supply that you need to, um, to reach that scale? Right, uh, those are great questions. So. Um, it's, the supply chain is something I think about all the time, both in the, in the short term and in the, in the longer term. Um, in the short term, we're largely using proteins uh, that have been uh, developed for other industries. So, um, for example, pea protein is one of the main proteins we pull from today, and that's largely a result of the starch industry, um, you know, separating uh, starch from the pea and then as a derivative of the protein, um, and, and we use that. Uh, but there's nothing particularly special about pea protein. Um, you know, if you look across the plant kingdom, there are literally hundreds, thousands of, 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 of feedstocks that we could be using. Um, you know, lupin is one that I'm quite interested in, camelina, mustard seed, um, uh, all of these um, have terrific sources of, of amino acids. Um, and, and literally, I mean, you could just keep going on and on. And, and, and what I'm really interested in is, is finding um, crops that are uh, particularly useful within particular regions of the country. Um, so looking at things like lentils and where those would grow best and allowing or enabling farmers rather to start growing um, protein directly in their fields where they were today, uh, are today growing you know, either wheat, corn, or soy uh, for the animal protein, for the animal market. Um, if they could start growing legumes uh, that we can pull protein from, they're gonna make more money um, and the soils are gonna be uh, uh, healthier, et cetera. Um, so in the short term, it's diversifying the proteins we pull from. And I think it's important because consumers want diversity. They don't wanna be having one source of protein every day. Uh, so we need to get, instead of you know, one or two proteins in the market, rice protein, pea protein, soy protein, et cetera, we need you know, dozens, right? And so when you go to a meat case in, let's say, six, seven years, if we're successful, you'll not only be able to pull um, you know, this current burger we have, which is uh, the Beyond Burger, uh, but sausages and, and other forms of, of meat made from a variety of proteins. So you can come home and you'll have a, a true pork experience, but it'll be made from lentil protein. Right, you'll have a, a very genuine burger experience, but it'll be made from lupin protein. And, um, and I think that is uh, where, where this industry is gonna head. Um, and you know, if you look at uh, uh, the meat case today, it's dominated right by, by animal protein. I think you know, year by year, you'll start to see that fade and you'll start to see these newer forms of protein in there in the form I mean, of meat. One of the key, the key things you've done, I mean, massive congratulations on this is to get your burgers on the meat aisle. Yeah. But there's been vegetarian you. food you know, for, for, for decades, but getting it on the meat aisle, giving people, you know, it's not about vegetarian, it's about, it's a different form of protein. Yeah, yeah, no, it was very important. And the turns we get when we sell in the meat case versus in the meat alternative section, uh, it's you know, 10X, 12X, 15X, depending on the store. Because people shop, 
in a certain place in the store for protein. And it's only if you know, you know that you want to go to the meat alternative section, first of all, it's difficult to find, et cetera. It's frozen, it's next to dessert. We want to be at the main stage and compete on the merit with, with, with animal protein. Great, so we have another question that's come in and it's around, um, not surprisingly, lab meat or cultured meat and how that technology, which we know is really nascent, how that compares from both a commercial and environmental perspective um, to what uh, Beyond Meat is, is creating or other alternatives that we're seeing out there. Sure. Um, so I, I know Uma uh, in, in Memphis Meats, um, which is one of the companies that's doing. He's a great company. He's a great guy, um, cardiologist. Um, and I, I, I looked at that extensively um, about 10 or so years ago. Um, and I think there's a real role for it. Um, uh, the challenge I saw with it was the costing down of, of the products. Um, you know, I'd come out of the fuel cell industry and there's a joke in that industry that fuel cells are good for the future and they always will be. <laughs> it's like, and I wanted to be part of something that I could commercialize in my lifetime. And I think Um will probably get it done. But then there's a the question of acceptance. Um, you know, will the consumer eat lab grown meat? And I'm just not so sure. Don Thompson is on um, my board. He's a former CEO of McDonald's. And I was talking to his, him and his wife a couple of years ago about um, just all the innovation that we're doing. And, and uh, his wife, wonderful woman, Liz, stopped me and said, uh, you know, innovation is great for my iPhone, but I don't want to put it in my mouth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it like sort of stopped me cold. I was like, you're kind of right. Um, and so that's a real hurdle for that, that technology. Yeah. There's actually th th three developments. There's the plant-based, so Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger. Uh, I thought we, we talked about you not going to mention <laughs> uh, who's his competitor? Uh, <laughs> what the hell? And, <laughs> and, um, and then there's, there's um, there, it, actually, the more diversity there is, obviously, there is, yeah. uh, the, more, the more demand, potentially. But there's, and then there's the cell-based, um, like Memphis Meats, that uh, Ethan mentioned, and then there's a, another the fermentation. Mm. Perfect day yeah. um, is is a is a great example of that. Milk from from a cow is 88 percent water and 12 percent proteins, amino acids, and sugars. And um, but you know why th there's a company called Perfect Day that uh, is brewing milk. You know I I was. Day before yesterday, I was patting Buttercup, which was a tank <laughs> 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 that was uh, producing milk, which is, is very exciting. Uh, that's, that is going to be the, one of the d closing down dairy farms. That's, that's what's going to do it. It's exactly the same process. That's, that's, really, exciting. Exciting. that's really exciting. All right, another question we have coming in is really around this issue of price parity given the existing um, subsidies that we have, at least in our country, toward meat and in many markets. What is it gonna take um, to get to price parity so that the McDonald's consumer, um, assuming we get to taste parity, that, that there's price parity with ground beef? Um, and then are there some changes we need to have uh, move forward in our agricultural policy system to actually level the playing field? I mean, I hate to say this, but McDonald's is, is one of the most advanced in moving away from factory farms, moving towards uh, organic milk and, and looking at its, its supply chains. So, you know, and obviously the, the subsidy system, I mean, Mark, you're probably the best person to talk about this, but the subsidy system for in, in it, in the US and Europe is crazy towards eggs and uh, milk, et cetera. Maybe. But it's also a question of enforcing existing laws and existing environmental laws, um, letting the EPA regulate the Clean Waters Act, other things that sadly seem to be on the verge of extinction at the moment. But um, if you do look at the externalities I was talking about before and you do say we can't afford to let Iowa, Nebraska, in the parts of Indiana, Ohio, it's Illinois, et cetera, have their topsoil be washed away, have their water be poisoned, and so on. If you say, we can't afford that, we don't want that. I mean, whether that's a, an investment disincentive or not, I don't know. 
but from a public policy perspective, it's certainly a, a disincentive. If you start enforcing those kinds of regulations and those kinds of notions, then you start to dissemble monoculture. If you dissemble monoculture, that is the growing of corn and soy in the Midwest, then you start dissembling factory farming that way also. Absolutely. But the reason why you have to grow all the corn and soy, as you mentioned, 85% of soy worldwide is fed to factory farms. 40% of the soy and corn in the United States goes to animals, 30% goes to biofuels, and the remainder goes to junk food. None of it goes to feed people. 2% of it goes to feed, pe pe to feed people things that are worth eating. Yeah. Oh, so, so we have another question here, which is, which is kind of looking out 20, 30 years to a planet where we have 11 billion people, um, and we have a, a growing, you know, emerging class of consumers in other nations, many of whom had very little protein, meat, animal protein in their diet in the past. Um, now, as we see, clamoring to have more animal protein in their diet. Can we really leapfrog in terms of introducing plant-based alternatives? Uh, what's it going to take? What are those countries going to need to do? What's going to need to change, say, in China or India to actually make something like this work? No. I, I don't want to answer that question. I want to say the reason that is such a great question um, is that it didn't say, how are we going to feed these people? Because the, the fact is the food exists. Absolutely. Population may be, may be an issue for any number of reasons. But it is, not an, it is not an issue as far as finding enough food to feed 9 or 10 or 11 billion people. We could do that tomorrow. Easily. So um, as for the rest of that question. But that, to me, it's such a great question because it didn't, it's very rare to come to a place like this and not have someone say, how are we going to feed 9 billion people? Because the issue is not um, producing enough food, we do produce enough food. The issue is what happens to that food, and of course the issue is poverty to some extent also. Uh, it's a, yeah, a very good question. Um, you know, I do think it's very possible to leapfrog, um, and I think you have to, because if you look at the uh, meat consumption curve in, in, in China and Asia, it, it'll wreck the planet if it continues. And then you look at Africa and it's very flat, but if that starts to also uh, take on the same slope as, as China, it'll wreck the, the climate. But that's why it's so important what you're doing because it's a cultural um, point that if you join the middle class, part of that culture is to eat more meat. Yeah. And, and so you know, it is so important that we create alternatives to animal meat, as it were, there's precedent. I mean, I, I hate to keep returning to the telecommunications example, but you know, you travel throughout parts of, of Asia, and there's just no. You go down the street, there's just you know, no telephone poles, right? It's just people went right to to to, to mobile phones, um, and so I think if you could t if you recognize the significance that meat plays in our psychology, right? It had literally created who we who we are. I mean, we were our part, our stomachs became uh, more more dense, and more energy went to our brains. Our brains got bigger. I mean, the Homo sapien is indebted to, to, to animal protein for, for, for our uh, intellectual ability, et cetera. Um, and so I don't think that you're going to convince uh, rising middle classes around the world not to eat meat. But you absolutely can provide them with a better alternative if you can get the science and, 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 and the, um, the, the uh, offering right. And, and that is possible, and it will happen, and it just it takes a little time. But yes, you, you make the product, they'll come to it, absolutely. Uh, and actually, but, so, but, what we don't have is fully is data, data of transmission of antibiotics from animals to humans. Um, what, what we're bringing out very shortly, we've done a meta study with the foundation, not fair, on, on um, the consequences of the overconsumption of meat. We're in a way the first generation to normally eat meat three times a day. I mean, that's changing in California and the world will follow, but it, it's a new phenomenon. Eating, eating meat three times a day. Mm -hmm. I used to have a slide that was four Earths and said that's how, that's how many Earths we'd need if yeah. the rest of the world were to eat meat the way we eat meat mm -hmm. from a resource perspective. So I have a question here from an equity analyst who covers JBS and Tyson and a few other large meat and agribusiness companies. And the question is, what are the, the key uh, performance and risk factors I should be evaluating to understand if these companies and their management are transitioning uh, to more resilient um, and sustainable long-term business model? Uh, well, we, we've, we've got a 
we've got on our website, we've got, uh, there, there are 28, so we, we've... Only 28. 20, <laughs> um, that, uh, that, that make it, to, it's, it's better to go to the website and have a look at that list. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, what about you, Ethan? I mean, you, you're, you've, got an, you've got Jeremy as your investor and you have uh, Tyson as your investor. Yeah. What's, your, what's your view on, on how they're thinking about these issues? Right, I think they are serious. I mean, I, I, um, I, I worked with Tyson for four or five years before uh, uh, this, this investment occurred. Um, when it started with Hillshire, and then Hillshire was acquired by, by Tyson, talking with them and, and everything else. So I think it is a serious uh, play for them. I don't think it's window dressing. We wouldn't have done it if that were the case. Um, you know, they are becoming much more focused on protein. And look, these, the, these supply chains aren't profitable at a certain point, right? I mean, they, they, you know, if you can move from, you know, without disclosing it, you can move from something that's like 10 or 12% margin to something that's 30, you want to do that. Um, and you know, th 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 there there is a, um, I think also just a, uh, a desire to get out of this. Um, you know, Tyson touches two out of every five plates in the United States with some form of food, right? Um, but yet uh, they're often uh, maligned in the media for this, that, or the other thing. Who wants that, right? There's another way, and I think we're helping them provide that. Uh, uh, can I just come back on that question, which, it, you know, it's actually probably the most important question. And, and I was vague in the answer, and, and I, was, I was vague because um, what we need to, what Ceres needs to do and FAIR needs to do and, and is part of is bridging the knowledge gap. Investors have a knowledge gap of what um, the key risks are individually for these companies, and, 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 that's, what, and that's what we need a, a lot of work on. That's why put a group like Ceres coming together uh, and FAIR, um, it, it's, it's vital because this initial, I think investors have just, like, like every, all of us, we're just becoming, a, I mean the majority, not all, but the ma majority of people are starting to become aware. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it has snuck up on us, all of this. It's the last 70 years, um, you know, it was much smaller when we were kids, and, and th there is a knowledge gap which we have to bridge. And that's why it's vital what, what series are, do are doing now. Right. You can't, you can't take responsibility for what happened before, but you can take responsibility <laughs> from what happens no. for, for what happens from now on. I keep saying that if we don't limit the marketing of junk food, every year that goes by that you don't limit the marketing of junk food to kids, is another year you're going to have grown-ups 25 years from now who don't know how to eat. And that's a serious yeah. problem. And 25 years from now, we're going to be sitting here and going, rising diabetes, why didn't we do this sooner? Cancer. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I'm, I don't want to be a Tyson booster, but uh, since it's, uh, they did announce, I'm pretty sure today, a new series of agreements with their poultry workers that if they carry through on them, will make them the most, I guess it's safe to say, the most progressive big food company in the country um, from a labor perspective, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, we have a question actually just to that point. Um, there was an observation made by one of the uh, participants in the room here that um, what we're talking about potentially in a transition away from factory farms is a disruption of a significant number of jobs. Um, maybe not the most desirable jobs, but we've seen how um, industry transition can be really politically difficult in our country. And um, what would be the, the plan politically to think about w what success looks like in terms of, of shifting um, jobs and, and other impacts that would be associated with, with a big move away from factory farming? But this is a bigger issue than one industry. This is happening in a dozen industries, two dozen industries. We need to figure out how to have people live meaningful lives in the United States with or without work or in the world with or without work and have the incomes that they need to be able to do that. You can't, if someone gave you the opportunity to abolish armies, it wouldn't lead to the question of well, what are we gonna, do? we would say what would we do with all those soldiers, but we wouldn't say let's keep them employed as soldiers. So if people are doing work that, that ultimately is damaging, 
it's up to society to figure out how to give them work that is ultimately gratifying. And actually, factory farms has been job destruction. It's, it's, yeah, it's actually absolutely. producing more food for less people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it, there's a, there's a, I was talking with Mark about this uh, recently. There's a, a book that I've just absolutely fallen in love with uh, called uh, Lentil Underground. And it's a story about it Lentil Underground. And it's a, written by Liz Carlisle, uh, who, a friend of yours, I guess. But um, it talks about the uh, farmers in Montana who basically just were so tired, referenced it earlier, tired of being caught between high input costs and, and low commodity prices for their crops, and just said, we're not going to do this anymore. And they started planting um, a variety of crops until they stumbled upon legumes and lentil. And they built a really big business out of that. Um, and so I, I don't view it as job destroying, it has to be job creating um, if we do it right. Great. We have a question here also about um, uh, fish farming. We haven't talked a lot about the role of the oceans and or inland um, production of fish um, as a protein source, but where does it fit into this mix? What are the risks and opportunities with current practices? As I think Jeremy mentioned, um, it takes something like four pounds of fish to produce, four pounds of wild fish to produce one pound of farmed fish on average. That is not a ratio that's sustainable, obviously. There are, I don't know a lot about this, but people who do say that fish farming is becoming more intelligent and more sustainable, um, they are developing vegetarian um, fish farms and sustainable fish farms. Uh, Feeding I, them cardboard and stuff like that. You, you <laughs> haven't got their meager input. No, but the, 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 they are. You know, you don't have farm fish has less omega um, than than wild fish, etc. So it, it's it's so there, it's there. There is a knowledge gap for you know. You've got you've got um, a number of NGOs really um, focused on this. What we have. I don't think anyone has translated that for institutional investors yet. So we're, we're expanding our, our quality program within the company and um, hiring someone to, to help us lead that. And the, the woman that I was interviewing this week uh, comes out of a, um, a protein company, a meat company, um, and uh, they, one of the products they have is fish meal. <laughs> and a lot of that fish meal just goes into feeding pork, into feeding uh, swine and, and, and creating pork rather. So, it's absolutely ridiculous to me that we're using the oceans to basically feed farmed animals. I mean, I just I can't, it's, I think something like a third of the catch, the weight of the catch from the ocean finds its way into the industrial agriculture markets. I just can't understand that. It's and that's, ludicrous. you know, this is, the United States is the best fisheries management country in the world, yeah. far, by far and away, yeah. and still stuff like that happens. So if you think about just the central thesis, if you think about we're doing all of these things, our fields, our oceans, and we're running it through a bioreactor that we haven't changed in millions of years. It's the, basically the skeletal and digestive system of the animal. Why wouldn't we disrupt that? <laughs> I see, we're done. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. That was really thank, great. Thank you.